Chapter Three of Among the Meadow People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claire. Among the Meadow People by Clara Dillingham Pearson. Chapter Three. The Selfish Tent Caterpillar. One could hardly call the tent caterpillars meadow people, for they did not often leave their trees to crawl upon the ground. Yet the apple tree tent caterpillars would not allow anybody to call them forest people. We live on apple and wild cherry trees, they said, and you will almost always find us in the orchards or on the roadside trees. There are forest tent caterpillars, but please don't get us mixed with them. We belong to another branch of the family, the apple tree branch. A tree frog said that he remembered perfectly well when the eggs were laid on the wild cherry tree on the edge of the meadow. It was early last summer, he said and the moth who laid them was a very agreeable reddish-brown person, about as large as a common yellow butterfly. I remember that she had two light yellow lines on each forewing. Another moth came with her, but did not stay. He was smaller than she, and had the same markings. After he had gone, she asked me if we were ever visited by the yellow-billed cuckoos. Why did she ask that? said the garter snake. Don't you know? exclaimed the tree frog, and then he whispered something to the garter snake. The garter snake wriggled with surprise and cried, Really? All through the fall and winter the many, many eggs which a reddish-brown moth had laid were kept snug and warm on the twig where she had put them. They were placed in rows around the twig and then well covered to hold them together and keep them warm. The winter winds had blown the twig to and fro, the cold rain had frozen over them, the soft snowflakes had drifted down from the clouds and covered them, only to melt and trickle away again in shining drops. One morning the whole wild cherry tree was covered with beautiful long glistening crystals of hoar frost, and still the ring of eggs stayed in its place around the twig, and the life in them slept until spring sunbeams should shine down and quicken it. But when the spring sunbeams did come, even before the leaf buds were opened, tiny larvae or caterpillar babies came crawling from a ring of eggs and began feeding upon the buds. They took very, very small bites, and that looked as though they were polite children. Still, you know, their mouths were so small that they could not take big ones, and it may not have been politeness after all which made them eat daintily. When all the tent caterpillars were hatched, and they had eaten every leaf bud near the egg ring, they began to crawl down the tree toward the trunk. Once they stopped by a good-sized crotch in the branches. Let's build here, said the leader. This place is all right. Then some of the tent caterpillars said, Let's, and some of them said, Don't let's. One young fellow said, Oh, come on, there's a bigger crotch farther down. Of course he should have said, I think you will like a larger crotch better, but he was young, and you know these larvae had no father or mother to help them speak in the right way. They were orphans, and it is wonderful how they ever learned to talk at all. After this some of the tent caterpillars went on to the larger crotch, and some stayed behind. More went than stayed and when they saw this, those by the smaller crotch gave up and joined their brothers and sisters, as they should have done. It was right to do that, which pleased most of them. It took a great deal of work to make the tent, all helped spinning hundreds and thousands of white silken threads, laying them side by side, criss-crossing them, fastening the ends to branches and twigs, not forgetting to leave places through which one could crawl in and out. They never worked all day at this, because unless they stopped to eat, they would soon have been weak and unable to spin. There were nearly always a few caterpillars in the tent, but only in the early morning or late afternoon, or during the night were they all at home. The rest of the time they were scattered around the tree feeding. Of course, there were some cold days when they stayed in. When the weather was chilly, they moved slowly and cared very little for food. There was one young tent caterpillar who happened to be the first hatched and who seemed to think that because he was a minute older than any of the other children, he had the right to his own way. Sometimes he got it, because the others didn't want to have any trouble. Sometimes he didn't get it, and then he was very sulky and disagreeable, even refusing to answer when he was spoken to. One cold day, when all the caterpillars stayed in the tent, this oldest brother wanted the warmest place, that in the very middle. It should have belonged to the younger brothers and sisters, for they were not so strong, but he pushed and wriggled his hairy black and brown and yellow body into the very place he wanted, and then scolded everybody around because he had to push to get there. It happened as it always does when a caterpillar begins to say mean things, 
and he went on until he was saying some which were really untrue. Nobody answered back, so he scolded and fussed, and was exceedingly disagreeable. All day long he thought how wretched he was, and how badly they treated him, and how he guessed they'd be sorry enough if he went away. The next morning he went. As long as the warm sunshine lasted, he did very well. When it began to grow cool, his brothers and sisters crawled past him on their way to the tent. "'Come on,' they cried. "'It's time to go home.' "'Uh-uh,' said the eldest brother, and that meant, "'No, I'm not going.' "'Why not?' they asked. "'Oh, because,' said he. When the rest were all together in the tent, they talked about him. "'Do you suppose he's angry?' said one. "'What should he be angry about?' said another. "'I just believe he is,' said a third. "'Did you notice the way his hairs bristled? "'Don't you think we ought to go to get him?' asked two or three of the youngest caterpillars. "'No,' said the older ones. "'We haven't done anything. Let him get over it.' So the oldest brother, who had thought that every other caterpillar in the tent would crawl right out and beg and coax him to come back, waited and waited and waited, but nobody came. The tent was there, and the door was open. All he had to do was to crawl in and be at home. He waited so long that at last he had to leave the tree and spin his cocoon without ever having gone back to his brothers and sisters in the tent. He spun his cocoon and mixed the silk with a yellowish-white powder, then he lay down in it to sleep twenty-one days and grow his wings. The last thought he had before going to sleep was an unhappy and selfish one. Probably he awakened an unhappy and selfish moth. His brothers and sisters were sad whenever they thought of him, but they said, "'What could we do? It wasn't fair for him to have the best of everything, and we never answered when he said mean things.' He might have come back at any time, and we would have been kind to him. And they were right. What could they have done? It was very sad, but when a caterpillar is so selfish and sulky that he cannot live happily with other people, it is much better that he should live quite alone. End of chapter 3 Recording by Claire